Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Basaganang Trip. I'm your host, Eli Claudio. I teach Southeast Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. So, on topic natin this week is something very serious. The topic is really pr police brutality in the United States. And of course, yung concomitant issue of Black Lives Matter and why we need to talk about this in terms of race. Because may mga iba pang Pilipino who don't talk about this in the context of race. And uh, lest you think this is something that's just for Americans to discuss, I think this is something that's very important for Filipinos to discuss. Because as we'll see, as may kita natin, na yung traditions of policing dito sa US may impact siya sa pag natin sa Pilipinas. So this is a discussion that needs to happen in the United States, but this is also a discussion that needs to happen in the Philippines. And to help me in this discussion are two very important Filipino academics who are also, who like me, are also based in the United States. Our first guest is the dean of academic, uh, the dean of academic affairs. Is that correct at the uh, Columbia Journalism School, uh, 2003 Ramon Magsaysay Award winner, uh, Dean Sheila Coronel. Thank you very much, Sheila, for joining us. And then with Sheila is a uh, professor of history at the University of Washington, Professor Vicente Rafael. Thanks, Vince, for joining us. So I, I think um, I'll start with Sheila and then we'll move on to Vince. Yung tanong ko lang is, what's it like there? What are the protests like there? And what, what have you learned? I went to my first protest over the weekend, which is very near my neighborhood because, you know, we can't venture very far. And it was very celebratory. It reminded me a little bit of EDSA. You know, there were people giving away food, water, masks. Um, people were chanting and, you know, they said no justice, no peace. And actually some of their chants, some of the chants resonated with me because I did a little bit of the coverage of the drug war in the Philippines when, when they chanted, uh, don't shoot, don't shoot, you know, and they put their hands up and said, don't shoot, don't shoot. It reminded me of this drug war victims who had their hands raised. And de los in the police, yes, uh -huh. exactly. It yeah. was like, you know, si Kian, ano bang, ano bang sabi niya? Wag po, wag po, may test ako bukas. Yeah, yeah. Yun ang, yeah. Yun ang sinabi ni Kian, yeah. And here it's, you know, don't shoot, don't shoot. Or even, even for journalists, because many of our students are out there covering the protest. And one of our students was, you know, had her hands up and saying, I'm press, I'm press. And yet she was hit by a rubber bullet and handcuffed and, and, and all of that. So to me, Looking at it, it 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 gives me sort of um, uh, like dizzy in comparison. Um, despite different different traditions of policing, and different issues, you know, certainly race is not an issue in the Philippines, but but the common issues of police overreach. Mm -hmm. if you want to use a neutral word word or police brutality or police abuses. Mm -hmm. It's it is global. It's not just in the United States. It's not just in the Philippines. It's, it's all over the world. Ako, I'm in the I'm in the East Bay, um, which is uh, well in Berkeley, but malapit kami sa Oakland. And you know, Oakland is one of the sites for a lot of the Black Power movements in the 1970s. So there's intense like political consciousness here. And the, the other day, I was really touched because I was just in the park walking, and then some an African American woman rolls down her window and says, "I just want to talk to you." because I think this society is dominating us black people. And I just want to know if people agree with me because I feel alone. And so that kind of conversation, um, the week after the George, George Floyd incident, and it was very, just very edifying for me. Um, how about you, Vince? Um, any experiences there? You know, I share some of uh, Sheila's thoughts and experiences. Uh, the, the resonances with EDSA are certainly very strong. Uh, in fact, uh, just today, I decided to go back because uh, somebody else asked me if I wanted to write a piece about this. So I decided to go down to Capitol Hill, which has been the scene of the most intense uh, uh, demonstrations, in part because that is where uh, the 13th Seattle Police Precinct is. And the, and the police precincts have been particularly uh, sort of like these, these magnets for a lot of these demonstrators, right? Uh, and in, in the last... Uh, eight or nine days, uh, it's been the site of, of, of very intense clashes. Uh, the, the mayor, especially, who had promised not to use tear gas, went back on her promise. Mm -hmm. And so it's been, it's been very, it's been very magulo, uh, as it were. Uh, but what happened is that uh, two days ago, uh, or rather yesterday, the police decided to abandon no, the precinct. 
and to give it to the to the uh, protesters. Uh, they bo- they boarded up the the the, the station. Uh, they completely withdrew, and so there are no police there at all. And so I decided, why well, I, I want to see what this looks like. And so I went down there. The protesters are all there. They've been camping out in the last ten days. It's incredibly peaceful, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a spirit of generosity and hospitality that pervades the entire area. Uh, they've renamed the uh, four blocks around the police station as uh, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like a liberated <laughs> zone. Maraming, maraming Pinoy, Vince? Uh, there must be, but you mm-hmm. know, I couldn't tell off the bat. Uh, it was mostly, it was a multiracial group, mm. uh, whites, uh, blacks, uh, Latinos, and so forth. So I guess the three of us are in places where there's been a strong history of black activism. Yes. You know, Harlem, mm-hmm. I live very near Harlem. You're in uh, Berkeley, you're in Oakland, Vince is in, is in Seattle. I, I went down there, and as I said, it's been designated. It's now that four block area, plus the park next to it, has been uh, uh, designated by the protesters as the uh, autonomous autonomous zone of Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill is the name of the area. And, and, and the police have, have completely abandoned the precinct. And I think Seattle is the only city where the police has completely withdrawn. There's no wow. police anywhere. Wow. And it's really made a difference, right? I mean, people just feel like they can breathe. Mm. You know, for once they can breathe. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, what happened is that uh, I was talking to some of the demonstrators. Very interesting. They said that when the police left the precinct, they left it unlocked because they were hoping that the demonstrators would go in and trash the place. They even left pallets of bricks uh, that they assumed demonstrators would pick up and use to smash the windows. And this, of course, would become a trap, right? They were setting a trap for them and an excuse for the police to come in hard, right? And, 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 and with guns blazing. But it's interesting, the, the demonstrators organized themselves into security teams, made sure that nobody entered the station, uh, made sure that the station's interior would be kept integral and inviolable, uh, and, and, and made sure that nobody damaged any of the businesses, right? So as a result, you now have a kind of interesting moment where uh, the call for getting rid of the police has actually been realized. But rather than chaos, what you have is a new kind of community, a new safe space where people can hang out. Nako, hindi ata may itinda ng maraming Pilipinian. You mean get rid of the police? Uh, yeah. It's yeah. a very strange concept even here in the it's, U.S., it but it's going to be strange for a lot of Filipino viewers. Yeah. But what I want to do is, is, is backtrack a little bit because it seems to me I was very surprised na meron tayong mga konting Filipino viewers dyan, mga matatalinong Pilipino who don't think that the issue of policing in the United States is about race. So last week, may nag-tweet, dean of a prominent law school saying, yeah, saw, uh, na yeah. bakit Black Lives Matter yung issue daw na ito when it is clearly just an issue of an abuse of power. So, you know, I mean, it's, this, this to me is very simple. If you're a black, black person in the United States, your chances of dying are, uh, at the hands of police are 33% higher than if you were a white person. Um, police killings is the sixth major cause of death for black people in the U.S. So you want to talk about a public health crisis. Actually, for black people, the police are a public health crisis. So anyway, can we just try to convince, I know this is very basic for, for us, but can we just try to convince some Pinoys that it is about race, Sheila? Well, I think you have to look back historically at you know, the origins of American policing, which really date back at, in, the, in the southern United States, at least it dates back to the slave, uh, the slave patrols. You know, Policing was originally intended to catch the slaves who were escaping. Mm. In in like, but in the Northeast, it was mainly policing was really directed against these unruly immigrants, especially the Catholic immigrants mm. that came later, or the Jews. You know, they were, you know, like much as we look at uh, poor people. You know, they lived in filthy conditions. They didn't speak the language. They were seen as threats to society, just as black, especially black men, were seen as threats, especially to black women. And to and to white proper uh, to white women, I'm sorry, and to and to white property. So, this this the what we see now is really the culmination of like, you know, more than a hundred years, two hundred years mm. of of American policing coming to this inflection point, where 
a specific sector of the population that is recognizable because of the color of their skin has been targeted and criminalized for, you know, as they, see, as they say here, for living while black. Mm. Now, one, one of my students did a story called Walking While Black in Jacksonville, Florida, where he just got all of the tickets for jaywalking in Jacksonville. And he found, you know, like 90 or more than 90% of them were of black people. And, not, and it's not because black people were disproportionately um, jaywalking. It's, it's because the police were targeting areas where, you know, poor black people were congregating or the intersections where they were going or places where there are no pedestrian lanes, where, which are near big highways where people can't cross. And so you have really the criminalization of ordinary things that black people are doing that are, have become the object or the target of policing in the name of keeping our city safe. Mm. And Vince, uh, hindi lang ito for, hindi, this doesn't apply to Asian Americans, right? I mean, it does, but it's not as intensely felt by Asian Americans. So Filipinos need some amount of empathy in order to see the world through the eyes of you know, the, the victims of police violence because they don't suffer as much from it, although they do, but you're still more likely to get killed if you're a black man than if you're a Filipino in the U.S. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. absolutely, because for one thing, I mean, I think Sheila brought up a really interesting point, which is that uh, the history of slavery, which of course lies at the foundation of uh, this country, of the United States, uh, is so intimately connected with black bodies. Mm -hmm. So to be black is to somehow still have that historical legacy on you, weighing you down. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, to be black is to be seen as an anti-citizen. You're not quite a citizen. And, and they're still associated with the legacy of slavery. And of course, to be a slave is to be a property, right? In this case, the property of white people. And so uh, this brings us to, I think, one of the basic features of policing. What is policing about? Policing is about the protection of property. Right? And if you happen to be black, you're perceived as somebody precisely who's not a citizen, instead who's an object, who's a thing to be controlled, who's a thing to be put in its place. Uh, and I think that's where you can make a connection between uh, the, pr the crisis of policing in, in the U.S. and the crisis of policing in the Philippines, mm. where policing obviously has always been for the benefit of the ruling class, mm. of the property classes, mm. uh, or whoever else is in charge. Mm. Uh, the police have, have, have nothing to do with uh, protecting citizens. They are, are, for the most part, really, uh, are there to protect uh, the, the rights and the privileges, mm. privileges of whoever is in power. Mm. Uh, one of the... I, so I just want to go back to this topic of the relationship of Asian Americans and even Filipinos in the Philippines with what's mm -hmm. happening here to black communities. Because if you listen to a lot of Asian Americans talking right now, the reason they say, especially the young ones, why their parents don't understand the crisis is because their parents think of themselves as a kind of model minority. I wonder if you can speak to that idea. Why, why does this idea of being a model minority preclude a generation perhaps of Asian Americans from declaring solidarity or being in solidarity with African Americans? Yeah, I mean, the notion of model minority is one of the most insidious uh, sort of uh, ideas that were always designed to sort of uh, uh, establish a wedge between Asian Americans and other minorities. You know, basically the assumption was that, well, if Asian Americans can make it, why can't Mexicans, why can't Blacks, why can't mm -hmm. Native people, right? And of course, the problem is 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 that uh, Asian Americans are certainly not uniformly successful. There are many of those who are economically and socially disadvantaged mm -hmm. as well, and they come to the U.S. as recent immigrants who already have college education and so have certain advantages uh, that other groups may not have. So that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, at least in the Philippines, I think many Filipinos come to the U.S. bringing with them certain deeply entrenched racist ideas that they get from things like Hollywood movies and, you know, reading stuff about the United States. Uh, I, I remember when I first came to the U.S. to go to school, my father was very worried because nobody was going to meet me at Kennedy Airport. Mm -hmm. 
And he kept saying, oh, you know, those black bus drivers, you know how they are, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's very scared yeah, that yeah. his, his oh. son might be endangered, right? So, mm -hmm. it, so there's a lot of this anti-black, mm -hmm. uh, uh, anti-Latino mm -hmm. sentiments among Filipinos themselves. Can you speak to that as well, Sheila? Why Filipinos have a hard time understanding the dynamic of race in the U.S., um, even Filipino Americans? I, I guess it's partly because it's very hard to understand the history of slavery, which distinguishes African Americans from any other racial minorities here in the U.S., mm -hmm. because other racial minorities haven't suffered through really sy systemic racism for like 400 years. Mm. Uh, they've been excluded from from schools, housing, you know, the base health, public health. They, they've had usually the lowest health, rec uh, the worst records in terms of health, in terms of dropout rates, and in terms of incarceration. You know, mm. Sixty percent of of people in jails are blacks. When blacks make up, I think 10, 15 percent, yeah, thirteen yeah, percent, less than fifteen yeah, percent yeah, yeah. of of the population. So there, there's really systemic racism here, which, which is not visible and has historical roots. And if you're new to this country, you don't, you don't get that. You, mm. don't, you don't quite understand that. Mm. Yeah, I, I, let, yeah. me, let me just say one thing. Sure, yeah. Uh, in, in that, uh, there's also a generational aspect to it. Yes. I think oh. there are generational differences. I think for the most part, uh, first-generation immigrants tend to be somewhat uh, less plugged into uh, the racial politics of the United States when they get here. Uh, whereas the second generation who went to school and with uh, first-hand experience of what it's like to be discriminated, who often find themselves uh, connecting with uh, people of color, other people of color in, in grade school, high school, and especially when they get to college, yes. right? They're the ones that are more likely to to uh, sort of uh, participate actively in these in these anti anti racist movements. So. Mm. I'd like to move on to the solutions that are being proposed here because this is another thing na bakar kailangan ipaliwanag sa Filipino viewers, which is this idea of defunding the police. What does that mean, Sheila? When we say defund the police, I think it's a good slogan, but nobody really knows as of now what it means. Basic, um, the concept is that. Um, the money that's being used to fund the police and the police here in the U.S. and like in the Philippines are really well funded. I mean, you can see that mm -hmm. from the armored cars and, and the gear and, and the uniforms and everything. I mean, the a Filipino policeman would be like envious of the kind of weaponry and resources. Pangera. Cars. Yeah. Oh. And nice cars, everything, all the bells and whistles of policing. Uh, so defunding the police, th that slogan basically means getting that money out of the police and putting it into social services. Mm -hmm. Because here what's happened is you have the expansion of policing activities to include, you know, taking care of the homeless, of the mentally ill and, and of drug addicts and all of that, which, you know, like in Minneapolis, they're saying, why should the police be doing these things? You know, communities should be doing these things. Communities mm -hmm. should be protecting themselves. It's mm -hmm. kind of, there's a little bit of a utopian thing, especially in the abolishing the police, yeah. the defunding yeah. the police, not so much. But in the abolishing the police, there's a little bit of a utopian view that if, um, if there are no policemen, communities can police themselves. And all of these resources that we're using to militarize and criminalize mm -hmm sections of our population can be used for social services. Yeah. I mean, there's certain element in that because there's really been studies that have shown, like here, um, some Columbia scholars have shown that if you, if you look at the rate of incarceration and you look at how much was being spent to, to put someone in prison, and they, they did that, you know, how many, in, by zip code, how many people were in prison, how much was being spent on keeping people in prison, versus how much is being spent on out of school use, you know, summer camps and things that will prevent people from going into what they call the school to prison pipeline. It's, there's a real disparity. So mm. the, the emphasis in the resources here in, in dealing with social problems, especially social problems dealing with so-called unruly minorities mm. has been policing mm. or as we know in the Philippines, militarizing or, law enforcement, law and order, rather than social policies that would address 
some of the root causes of those issues. So I think the whole defunding, abolishing the police idea comes from that. But I was listening to an interview by uh, the Daily and asking, you know, what does it mean? I mean, mm. people have varying ideas of what it means to defund the police. It's, it's really more of a, of a, of a concept. Mm. Yeah. Than yeah. actually react. Yeah. I don't yeah. understand why it's so <laughs> controversial. Um, because I mean, we work in academia and we get defunded all the time, right? And nobody yes. says that it's controversial when you defund educators. When you know, I think personally, education is a lot more important than policing. How about for yeah. you, Vince? What's uh, well, what I, does I, defund I mean, the police mean? Yeah, I I, th I think that the idea of defunding should be seen in contrast with the history of police reform. Mm -hmm. Clearly, reform has failed. Because usually with reform, every time, every time there's a problem with the police, they say, oh, we need reforms, right? Uh, but clearly, one of the things that reforms entails is putting more money into the police, hiring more police forces, mm -hmm. buying them more equipment from cameras to guns, you know, uh, increasing training and so forth. And it stands to reason that, you know, none of these reforms have worked. So yeah. the idea of reform now uh, feels, feels like a joke, like, it's a, like it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible ruse. So people now have moved to this idea of defunding, and defunding is something that comes right out of the Black Lives Movement. Uh, and it's, it's been going on for a long time, and actually the best ideas about defunding have come from the leaders of yeah. Black Lives Movement. It means several things. Number one is to end racism and make sure that black people stop dying in the hands of the police. Mm -hmm. Number two, it means demilitarizing the police forces, right? No longer arming them with this heavy duty uh, equipment that make it sound, that make them look like occupying forces, mm -hmm. you know, and make citizens look like they were being uh, sort of persecuted in a war. Uh, number three, it means shifting policing functions uh, and as, as, as uh, Sheila pointed out, increasing social services, right? Uh, uh, increasing uh, counseling, for example, education, public health, mm -hmm. housing, which are all the reasons why uh, you have all these social problems. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then uh, I think the last part of it is that making sure that the police uh, no longer has to do the kinds, the kinds of sort of uh, what you might call menial uh, law enforcement tasks like traffic stops, uh, uh, f for example, getting rid of, of domestic violence and that sort of stuff, you know, shifting those functions to other people. Because usually what happens is the moment the police intervene, that's always a recipe for escalation. Kaya ako natatakot tuwing nakikita ko police. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I try to avoid the police, I, I, both in the U.S. and in the Philippines. In the Philippines. Yeah, <laughs> punta na tayo sa Pilipinas ngayon. Uh, I wanted to ask Sheila, um, because the language of defund the police, I mean, it, I don't know if it will take off in the Philippines, but the term I think we use is security sector reform. Um, is that still enough in the context of the Philippines, the idea of security sector reform? And what does it even mean at this, at, at this point? I think, you know, part of, part of the problem with this, what they call reforms, and, and, Vince, and Vince is, has been said, you know, a lot of the reforms have to do with so-called mod modernizing mm. or professionalizing the police force, meaning more equipment, more training, you know, better crime lab facilities, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't address the fundamental question of police accountability um, for, for abuses. And this is why without addressing accountability issues, you know, just putting in more money, into reforming the police or giving them lessons on human rights, mm -hmm. which, you know, a lot of, you know, recently American aid to, to policing in the Philippines has been making them attend lectures on human rights. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so all of these are sort of like very superficial reforms, unless you really address the question of accountability within the police and also transparency within the police. Uh, you really will not address, you, there's no way you can stop police abuses. And it's the same problem here in the U.S. One mm -hmm. of the reasons why police abuses have been able to, you know, go unpunished is because of the strength of the police unions. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Philippines, we don't have police unions, but what we do have are politicians who rely on the police to be their enforcers. And the president and who says shoot to kill. Exactly, and a president who has really, you know, made the police kind of his, his 
this president has given more to the police than I think any other president. He's really much more at home with the police because he's a mayor and the mayor deals directly with the police and he knows, he knows how to deal with policemen. He knows how to make policemen do their will. He has very good relations with the police and he's given them, like if you look at the task force that looking at the quarantine, a lot of them are former policemen. Mm. And so he sees policemen mainly as the main arm of government. So it's really expanded mm. police functions mm. beyond mere policing. I mean, um, coronavirus is a public health issue, but you have policemen and military men at the front lines of dealing with that issue, and not mm. epidemiologists, not, mm -hmm. not doctors, right? And so this is a little bit of what Vince was saying in terms of the expansion of, of the police powers, partly because it's politically expedient for heads of state, for politicians to call on the police as first, you know, as a weapon to wield against opposition and their enemies, and also as a method, as Duterte has done, of really asserting political control. Hmm. I want to ask the historian because may link eh, yung policing sa Philippines and yung policing dito sa US. One of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why policing in the Philippines is so violent is because of the colonial legacy. Can you speak about Absolutely. that colonial leg legacy a little bit, Vince? Yeah. Well, you know, Al McCoy, of course, uh, in his book, Policing the Empire, you know, discusses this in, in great detail. And, and uh, the idea of the police began in the Philippines, at least, in the modern Philippines, no? uh, you, you could trace it back to the late Spanish colonial period, but much more uh, during the American colonial period, the police, first and foremost, is a counterinsurgency force. Mm. I mean, it's yeah. really directed towards pacification, mm. right? Uh, and the military sort of follows in that route, where the idea is not really to protect against external enemies, it's really to protect against internal subversion, right? So if you think of policing as counter-subversive, then you can think of the culture of policing, which Sheila and I have been talking about, mm. the culture of policing as a counter-subversive culture, mm. which is dedicated towards looking at scapegoats, uh, towards containing those uh, sections of the population it deems to be dangerous and excessive, whether they're drug addicts, they're thieves, or whatever. And or anti-colonial revolutionaries. Or anti-colonial well, revolutionaries. I mean, it's not just the U.S. Right. There was the Cuerpo de Vigilancia right. during the That's time right. of the Spaniards. That's right. And doing so for the benefit of those people who pay them. For the benefit mm. of, you know, which is to say, you know, the ruling class or the Americans or whatever, right? Uh, which is why police will never arrest the rich. They will always yes. just, you know, mm. arrest the poor. So, mm. yeah. So, so when, 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 you, when you see that, you realize that what you're dealing with here is a, a, a policing culture uh, that is meant to uh, sort of uh, you know reinforce order, which is always understood mm. as as uh, some kind of social mm. hierarchy, whether it's racial hierarchy or whether it's economic social hierarchy. So, Sheila, ano yung mahinihiram natin na policing practices from the U.S. that has been really detrimental for us? You know, the Philippines has been a very good, both a very good student of American policing as well as a as a testing ground for American theories. And sometimes theories. innovator, unfortunately. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. So, but, but like in, in more recent years, you know, the war on drugs that started here in the 70s and the 80s is still resonates even now. Marcos mm -hmm. certainly had a war on drugs and several Philippine presidents after him did and certainly Duterte carried that to the extreme. Broken windows policing, which became mm -hmm. fashionable sometime in I think, the early 80s. Can you explain uh, that concept of broken windows policing? Broken windows means that you look at the broken windows. That means you go after petty offenders as a way to get after, in, as a way to establish peace and order. Mm -hmm. So you're not just going against big time criminals and everything, mm -hmm. but you go against the pickpockets, you go against the people who break the windows, etc. And now you're small time pusher. And and that and, and and in fact, some some Filipino policemen say that um, this drug war is some version of broken windows policing mm. because you have to get at the, the small time pusher oh, in order yeah. to, to establish or to get at the you know to establish mm. law and order. Um, there are there's 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 others um, war on drugs, war on crime, broken broken windows policing, community policing, mm. um, U.S. style, is also, was also very much in the vogue as part of the whole police reform movement back, back in the 90s, certainly I think during Gloria's time when the police was, you know, the police has always been under scrutiny 
in the Philippines from you know for the past hundred or so years. So, so every time there have been these movements for reform, and where do um, Philippine officials look for for ideas for reforming the police? They look at the U.S. Mm. And you see the irony of that if you look at what's happening in the U.S. Mm. now, right? Mm. You have the U.S. actually proselytizing, disseminating its policing method as a model for the world. And certainly sending trainers and advisors and training manuals, et cetera, et cetera. They are advising police in the Philippines even mm. up to now. Mm. They have these model police stations. Yeah. And, and what do they model that on? They model that on U.S. US policing, which is largely intelligence, infiltration, counter-surveillance, going after the enemies of the state, you know, also going after, and, and also against criminals, of course, but especially yeah. uh, transnational criminals and terrorists, because the aim of all of this assistance is not to keep the Philippines safe, but is to keep the U.S. safe. Mm. Yeah. But on, in a way, it's, 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 don't... It's, it's, sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I just, just want to add to that now. Uh, I, I think there's a really interesting connection between the military and the police in this case, because uh, the U.S. military historically has always been, uh, you know, sort of when they intervene, they always describe their intervention as a, a police work, policing function, right? Uh, they're not there to take territory or annex territory. They're just simply there to impose, you know, some kind of world order. And so they, they use a lot of policing functions. Curfew, number mm. one. Curfew is very, very important because curfew places an entire population under some kind of carceral control. Handcuffs, when you think about handcuffs, they seem so yes. simple, and yet they're the most universally visible method of policing. Billy clubs, of course, guns, mm -hmm. and then the uniform. The mere fact that they're all wearing this particular kind of uniform sets them apart from the population and places them in this special category, right? Uh, and it goes on and on and on. So there's a really interesting uh, interchange between the military and the police, whereby the police borrows from the military and the military borrows from the police. Uh, and, and both, both uh, are, are dedicated precisely to imposing this kind of uh, law and order, uh, as you always often think. So, yeah, but why do police even need rocket launchers? Because here, they, they get rocket launchers from, from, from the Pentagon. Yeah. I mean, yeah. why? What, in what world do you need that? So there's this really sense... Well, why not? Why not? No, you know it's, what I mean? It's, it's, <laughs> it's, part of, it's part of the counter-terrorism training. Okay. Mm. Yeah. 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 No. It's, it's supposedly like, counter-terrorism, but really, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want, to, I want to talk about yung, yung, uh, the notion again of defunding the police because, Vince, you were saying now, we can't use the term reform anymore because the problem is much more systemic than that. But in the context of the Philippines, what would defunding, I'd like to ask both of you, and let's start with Sheila, what would defunding the police look like? Um, less money for the police, more money for the barangay tanods. I mean, can you imagine what it would look like in the Philippines? Well, you know, if you, if you look at a police station, and if, and you, I mean, I've, I've been to police stations, and I see how policemen live. They're, they're poor people, this, the ordinary patrolman. And, and, and so the, to me, it's, it's, not, it's not quite the same, but I think it's, it's more than defunding. It's rethinking what kind of policing you need. Mm. Uh, the Philippines, the, you, know, you do need somebody to take care of crime, to arrest the petty criminal. I mean, who, who performs that function? Will it be the barangay tano? Will that not... Um, who, who do they report to? Who yeah, because the problem is that the police are police, yung tanod, eh, yung exactly. ng police, drug list ng police, galing sa tanod. Yes, Tapos kaaway ng tanod yung nasa listahan. Yeah, but gag gagawin mong parang warlord yung, mini warlord yung barangay captain, di ba? Because mm. he has all of this army. So, so let, we have to think of this carefully, who we give this coercive power yes. policing yeah. to, because at least the police, there's, there's a hierarchy and there's, there's not, not much accountability, but there is because, you know, there's sort of a centralized control and they're theoretically under civilian control because they're on, they report to the Department of Interior and local mm -hmm. government. But, but the whole theory really collapses because they are so easily used as instruments of politi political power. I think what we need to do is cut that. 
I think fundamentally that's the problem. It's not so much defunding. With certainly it is. We're thinking, but it's also you do need some sort of core anti crime. I don't know what Vince thinks. I but I really do think you need some sort of who's going to go after organized crime, mm -hmm. for example. But they have to be separate. There has they have to be insulated from politics, and I don't know how you do that. Yeah, but I think that's a isa pa yung concrete US legacy yung ano mayor yung nagapoy ng hepe. Yeah. That that's that's exactly. straight out of the United States policing playbook because it's yeah. not a national police; it's a heavily lo heavily localized police. That's why you get right. arguments even between Sara Duterte and the president because the mayor asserts her power to appoint her police chief. Um, Vince, yeah. um, I want you to think about how I I, I I I guess I'll just pose the same question. Um, defund the police is that something that works in the context of the Philippines? And if if, if it does, um, like how do you imagine? Yeah, it or not? yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I agree. There are insuperable obstacles and problems because you really would have to rethink what you mean by security, what you mean by crime, right? Because I mean, the police really is the handmaiden of the state. You cannot imagine a state without the police. If you think of the state, the classical definition of the state as the agency that is, has a monopoly on the use of violence, mm. right? And who's going to exercise that violence? Of course, and the, the monopoly police. over now, your body. We haven't even talked about it, it, yung mga exactly, sa na to. Exactly. Now, now if, you, if you rethink the state, as not simply a violent agency, but an agency that cares, mm -hmm. the state as that which looks after the benefits of not just a few people, but everyone. In other words, a democratic state. So I think, I think yes. defunding the police is inseparable from democratizing the state, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is all very abstract. I don't know how you're gonna, I don't know how you're going to actually uh, sort of operationalize this. But I mean, for me, this would be the broad principles. Instead, mm -hmm. of, instead of falling back on this notion, well, of course, you need the police because you have crime, right? But then there's this larger question of, well, what do you do with, why do you have crime in the first place? Well, you have crime because, you know, life is hard. People need mm -hmm. to get, fun. people need to eat, people need to, you know, find these things. And so, and so, so there's that connection between uh, criminality and policing. Uh, so long as you have criminals, you will have police. Mm. So in order to do something about the police, you need to do something about not just criminals, but the very idea of criminality, mm. which is why I think the question of democracy is crucial. That, 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 that's a great answer. I mean, if democracy, I think if you ask average people, what do you want to spend more money on, for example? I honestly think people would rather spend more money on education than on policing. I mean, I may be naive, yeah. I think the average Filipino wants to be able to go to college rather than, rather than pay for an institution that's killing people left and right right now. And, and that's democratic, I think. Um, I think to end, um, this is a bit badoy, but dito sa US ngayon ang uso is uh, yung anti-racist reading list. So, and since this is a show by a teacher for students largely, um, I want both of you to recommend, maybe not so much an anti I think anti-racist reading list, but the kind of reading list that is apt for this time. Um, and this time is a time of uh, intense policing. This time is a time of intense racism. What, what kind of book should people read? Um, let's begin with Sheila. I think, you know, um, it's very hard to get books in the Philippines, but there's a lot of stuff you can get online. Tanahisi Tana Coates's um, Atlantic magazine piece on the case for reparations mm. it's a very good primer on racism in the u.s and what can be done about it um nicole hannah jones's 1619 it's controversial to historians but there's some good you know the new york times did this special uh edition podcast. to mark the 400 mm. it's, it's a podcast and it's also a uh, an entire magazine issue mm. that's that's good to look at i would also say if you have netflix you should watch 13th which is ava duvernay's uh, documentary on basically it's it i think it was done in 2016 or 2017 but it's it, it's really if you have let's say if you have one and a half hours you should you should watch that because it's a very good uh, explanation of the criminal justice system, mass incarceration, and the targeting of especially black men. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about something on policing in general? On policing, if, if you had time, I think Al McCoy's um, Policing America's Empire is, is, 
is good, but it's absolutely, oh, absolutely. <laughs> but it's yeah. great. How about you, Vince? What's what's your reading list for for these for these dark times? Yeah, in terms of policing, uh, this is this is very interesting ebook uh, that you can download from Versa called "Police: A Field Guide," uh, which I highly recommend. Very short, uh, and then uh, there are many many others. Uh, who have written David Correa, Alex Vitale has written several books on, on uh, the uh, sort of ethnographies and histories of policing in the United States. In terms of race, I mean, I think one can start with uh, the structuring uh, sort of uh, uh, force uh, behind racism in the United States, which is white supremacy. Right? Mm-hmm. To understand race, you need to understand white supremacy, right? And there are many things that you can read on that. I would say anything by James Baldwin. Would be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you have net, if you have Netflix, oh my there's god, a great, uh, oh, it's uh, great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's a, I'm there's a great Negro. documentary called "I Am Not Your Negro." I mean, please watch that. It's just, it's so, yeah. it's yeah. so educational. Yeah. And there are many, many others. There's, there's the the Thirteenth Amendment by uh, Abba Duvernay. There's uh, "When They See Us," which is about the the Central Park Five. Uh, several documentaries on Martin Luther King. Uh, and so forth and so on. So, so there's there's lots of those things that one can start with. So mm. I would recommend. Um, well, uh, that's about all the time we have. I'd like to thank uh, Vince Rafael and Sheila Coronel for joining us today. And I hope they helped you realize that important is in us. Um, not just because we should care about injustice everywhere. And this is a clear, what happened to George Floyd was a clear case of injustice. Biro mo, tinuhod sa leg for nine minutes hanggang mamatay, di ba? Um, that's a clear case of injustice. And regardless of where you're from, you should care about it because you're a human being. But I think you should also care about it because these are, top, these are things that are happening in the Philippines. If you look at the way George Floyd died, it's very reminiscent of the way Kian De Los Santos died. He said he couldn't breathe, right? He said he wanted his mother. And Kian De Los Santos was just telling people that he was just telling the police that he wanted to do his homework, right? And yet, both Kian De Los Santos and George Floyd were killed. We have to have a serious conversation about, if not, if not defunding the police, then at the very least, overhauling it, reforming it significantly. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in two weeks' time.